Okay. So, uh, so let's move into uh, our next panel, which is going to be, you know, the global black struggle in uh, literature, um, uh, music, and I should say psychology. And um, <clears throat> so, welcome to to this. Um, uh, afternoon uh, panel, and um, <clears throat> we're going to open with um, Joanne Joanne Hillhouse, and of course Joanne needs no introduction. She is so well known uh, among us. Uh, <clears throat> she is, of course major writer from Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, and, you know, is the author of novels such as uh, The Boy from Willow Bend, Dancing Nude in the Moonlight, and of course, the novel, Oh God. Uh, this afternoon, uh, <clears throat> She's going to be talking to us. Uh, well, the title of her paper, I should say, is The New Caribbean Daughters of Africa, a review focused on Caribbean women's voices in the book New Daughters of Africa. So, Joanne, over to you. Good afternoon. Hello, hello. <laughs> it's so good to see you, Padgett. It's been a while. Good afternoon yeah. to everyone. And thanks for the invitation to, thanks for the opportunity to present. I'm going to share my screen. So let me know, Padgett, when you can see it. Okay, we can see you. Okay, so as you said, I'm presenting a paper entitled New Caribbean Daughters of Africa Review Focus on Caribbean Women's Voices in New Daughters of Africa. And the reason why, well, one of the reasons why I decided to focus on New Carib on Caribbean women's writing in New Daughters of Africa is because it's quite an expansive book it's 800 pages 200 women of um women writers of african descent uh, so basically from across pretty much the entire diaspora and you know we're everywhere um it was published first in march 2019 and um i actually just finished reading it <laughs> it took me a while um but i'm right on time for the release of the penguin edition of the book um it has been well received from my observation. Uh, it is the I, I sort of a sort of sequel to Daughters of Africa, which was published 25 years before it. And it's edited by Margaret Busby, who has um, African and Caribbean roots. Uh, I won't go into all of the reviews, but just a couple conversations about culture, love, inheritance, and more is how Financial Times described it. And the anthology brings these works into dialogue with one another. And I think that's why that's going to be my focus, connecting the works to one another, showing how they're tackling similar themes. But I'm going to be focused on the Caribbean. As I said, it covers over 100 years of writing, organized by decade of birth. And the Caribbean writers, there are 21 writers from across the English, French, or Spanish Caribbean, in terms of writers with Caribbean roots, as in they have family, father, mother from the Caribbean, such as example, Antiguan in this section would be Naomi Jackson. She was born in the 1980s. Her father's from Antigua, her mother's from Barbados. And her book, you might be familiar with it, is The Sad Side of Bird Hill. And that's a book that's excerpted in this. And I'm going to include Naomi, even though um, I'm not focusing on um, writers from the Caribbean diaspora, 
Now, in terms of born, writers born in the Caribbean, there's 39 writers included. And of that, 19 are what I'm calling Banya, Libya, Caribbean writers, as in they were born in the Caribbean and they lived or lived or passed on in the Caribbean. And um, uh, even if they lived for some time overseas. I am the only writer from Antigua in this section. So there are only two writers from Antigua in this collection. I understand in the Daughters of Africa, Jamaica King Clay, who is also from Antigua, was included in that one as well. So that's just to give the frame for this sort of introductory presentation on New Daughters of Africa. Um, Naomi Jackson, they said her book, The Star Side of Bird Hill, is excerpted in New Daughters of Africa. Um, some of the themes that she tackles, um, I see it's, it's a 16 year old girl, Dion, who is home, back home, quote unquote, in Barbados for the summer. Um, she's spending her birthday there and she's not happy. She's originally from Brooklyn. Um, so it's a coming of age story in one sense. It shows the, it, it leans into the contrast between life in, the, in Barbados at that time and life in Brooklyn at that time from a teenage perspective. As she's a teenage girl coming of age, it also looks at things like gender and sexual awakening. Um, so for instance, when she, the guy that she's seeing while she's um, in Barbados, she asked that they meet up at the graveyard behind the church, don't ask. At least Antiguan should understand this because the big church graveyard was also a meeting place, maybe not for romantic um, get togethers, but for, you know, limes and all this sort of thing. So, so she asked him about what he wants to do with his life because she's feeling restless about um, all the choices being foisted on her. And he says, I guess I never thought I had a choice. His name is Trevor. He said, it's not like in the States, here on the hill, who you are is who your people have been. And he's speaking there to a certain um, limitedness of his existence and also the, but at, at the flip side of that is the continuity of his existence. Um, so she decides to have sex with him, but she realizes that she is not going to have a future with him because she wants different things. Um, when they were done, Dion took her panties in one hand and her new Bible in the other and let the breeze, when it came, touch her where Trevor had been. I like this sentence because of the symbolism in it. And I also like what it's doing with the nature imagery where the breeze is actually um, almost seems to have a purpose um, beyond being sort of a passive um, thing. And I'm gonna tie that to the use of nature in Meta Davis Cumberbatch's A Child of Nature, Negro in the Caribbean. Meta Davis Cumberbatch, um, who lived from 1900 to 1978, is from Trinidad and Tobago. She moved with her husband to the Bahamas and she became known there, I believe, as the mother of the arts. And that's her, her book that has been really, uh, published posthumously, I believe, by her son. So in her poetry, um, we see nature as an antidote um, to the fraught history of Black people in the Caribbean, the colonialism, the, 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 the history of slavery, the, you know, the classism, all of it. And one of the interesting things about this for me was how ownership of space in that all of these things are happening, but something you see a lot, reading this book, something you see a lot in literature from Caribbean people who relocated is that um, sense of trying to find place in that space where they're now relocated to and not always feeling fully accepted. And I think part of what makes her so assertive in this poem um, about not being who you, who you define her as is that she feels at home where she is. So I describe that as the privileges of home. So a, a few excerpts, I roam the fields, pluck the flowers, spend nature happy hours, bear my body to the sun, share its rays, leap and run. There's an almost idyllic sense of nature there. I live, I love, I laugh, I sorrow. And with the addition of sorrow there, you realize that it's not about escaping reality, but it's about putting reality into perspective. I toil, I labor for my bread, for shelter for my weary head. Yet lacing under a shady tree, I feel the world belongs to me. And that goes back to what I was saying about the privileges of home. 
Nature is to me quite kind. Nature again coming across quite active here. Nature is to me quite kind. The air, the sky, the land, the sea, fruits in season are all there for me. The moon, it shines and lights my way. I have to say, when I read that last um, line, the moon, it shines and lights my way, I, I found myself thinking about how that moon has been witnessed to so many. That's that long line from the, the plantation in terms of our presence here on this part of the world, the plantation forward and through time. And so um, because the book is moving forward through time from the, the pre-1900s forward, um, I'm gonna move forward to Andaye. I hope I'm saying her name correctly. She's Guyanese. Um, and she was about, she was an activist from what I read and very much focused on black women um, activism. And you see it in the writing, her piece in this is a nonfiction piece, Audrey, there's Rosemary, that's for remembrance, for Audrey Lord, 1992. Um, the, the, the essay begins with the first time she met Audrey Lord, just a fairly sort of cantankerous um, first meeting, but they became quite good friends. and. Um, bonded in sisterhood through the struggle of surviving and eventually not surviving cancer. Um, through the process of writing it, you, you learn about, she's very candid about the things that are broken in the system, in our institutions in the Caribbean, in the healthcare system. Um, but she also speaks about our Caribbean-ness, the who-ness of us, um, how we respond to things. So in terms of her friendship with Lord Audrey, and so began my friendship with Audrey Lord around the sharing of the fear of living with perhaps dying from cancer. She wrote often, mostly on cards. Um, in terms of the response to her diagnosis, I remember people coming in, the women breaking the silence of awkwardness by asking me what I needed, washed or ironed or bought for the hospital. The men not socialized into housework, having nothing to break the silence. Um, and there's another element of gender there in terms of how we are socialized to, to, to show our, our emotions or to express our emotions. And a takeaway from this essay as well was the powerlessness that you feel sometimes in the face of something that you'd have to endure, but you can't stop it from happening. It, 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 hap it is happening to you and you have to find the reserves to fight it. Um, which is part of the Black experience as well. Um, powerlessness sometimes can manifest as loneliness, um, which is what I thought when I read A Perfect Stranger by Trinidad and Tobago writer Barbara Jenkins, who was born in the 1940s and didn't start writing until she was in her 70s. And she has made up for time in amazing ways. She's published three books already and she's won many awards. But in this particular story, which I, I, I think of as a, a, a meet cute, <laughs> you know, in the movies where you have the setups for characters to be, so it's sort of a love story, but it's 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 about a woman, a young young woman who is studying overseas. Um, Barbara lived for the UK in the UK for some time. It's about a young woman who is living overseas and um, is on is lonely. She's on campus. She's off. It's during the vacation or whatever, and she's feeling displaced, far from home. So those are some of the themes coming through there. And also about love and belonging. Love because it's a story. Belonging because you can find that sometimes in another person. That's what we give to each other as community, whether it's in romantic love, whether it's in sisterhood, whether it's in something else. Um, so I'll just give, share some excerpts. The first time I saw your face, the world I knew before fell away. I closed my eyes to capture your image, to hold it behind my eyelids, to gaze at it inside my head. That's intense. The good nature teasing about how awkwardly I was coping with the strangeness around me. That's that's part of what sent her into the spiral, sent her into the bathroom at the, the dorm where she met the man who she's waxing poetic about. Um, being uh, The whole idea of being away from anyone who belonged to me, you know, sometimes it overwhelms when she was overwhelmed. Um, but the story is also about the loss of that love because although it's centered on their meet cute, it also, the parallel time track in the story is after he has died. And Barbara has a very sort of dry Caribbean wit in her way she exp expresses things. And I like this line. Um, describing herself, she says, one passed the best before age of three score and 10 and the other crystallized dust in a jar lying in a teak box on the dressing table. 
So that's she and her husband, how they ended up. But the story ends with when they met. He asks, are you going to be all right now? And she answers, yes. Angela Barry writes a story without prejudice about a, a, a woman who is meeting her niece for the first time. The woman's mother was an immigrant from Africa and um, from the continent. And I apologize, I'm forgetting the name of the country. Um, but she, the story is set in the UK and the child was lost. Um, Angela is another person who has lived overseas. She's lived in part, different, different countries in Africa and she's lived in the UK. She lives in Bermuda and she's from Bermuda. Um, but the story is about love and loss because, and it's about the immigrant experience, which is something I know we can relate to as Caribbean people as part of our, our journey. We travel to different islands. We travel outside of the Caribbean. In this case, it's an African immigrant to the UK who loses her child in the system. And this meeting of the aunt and the niece is the, the first time the family is reconnecting. And we learn through the course of the story, it's not really the first time because the mother did try to find her child, but, we, but family could not stand up to class and privilege in the UK and, and um, also the forgetting that happens in the face of trauma, which is something again, which is part of our experience. Um, so when she meets her niece, when she finally acknowledges to herself that this is family, the line that stood out to me was the hand that was so much like her own or the fragment of a line that stood out to me, the hand that was so much like her own. Um, a hand about connection and very much about the black experience. Um, Marion Bessel is from uh, um, Bahamas and she has three poems in this collection. We were terrestrial once maybe of Cory Shells and Revolution and Nina 1984, Nina 1984 referring there to Nina Simone and uh, a session in a in a um a blues joint in new york somewhere um this these poems i think what connects them is the idea of connection with place with each other um the black experience we see nature culture the arts coming through this is one of my favorite lines you hold down those jazz and blues keys until the dog stops snapping and snarling and until the water hoses run dry and we know that music and the arts is one of the things that sustained us and allowed us to express the pain. And the blues is a big part of that. We know Calypso in the Caribbean is a big part of that. Um, so it, there's something that happens in the arts that kind of threads through our collective psyche. Um, Carolyn Cooper um, leaned into humor. Um, one of the things I like about is that we, we laugh, we cry, we, we muse, we take, you know, we do, we have a full range of expressions and emotions and so on. And this particular piece is about finding romance online in 2018. Um, it's a non, it's a creative nonfiction piece, I believe. And it's about modern dating. It's about gender. It's about um, slice of Caribbean life, including class. Um, so some of her experiences, another young man told me with greater self-assurance that I wouldn't have to worry about going out with him to social events. As he put it, you know, and for, you know, and for keep my mouth shut. So where she was concerned about, you know, the, the, the basically that, that's kind of shed a light on the perceptions about the class differences and about, you know, the, the gender, the, 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 the gender relations and the, the, the sort of the zigzagging of all of it. Um, this is another one, the professor, or oh, the professor was one who didn't want to date the character. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily Miss Karen Cooper, but the character in, this, in, in the essay, um, because she was too famous. You know, somebody in, in rural Jamaica knew her, so he decided that she was too well known. And she meant, she, she, she says, the professor would have come up with a better excuse, could have come up with a better excuse. In the age of the internet and cell phone, connectivity across all media is the norm. This is a very funny piece. I'm not doing it justice. It's a very funny piece. And that's kind of the point of it. It's just, it's humor and modern gender relations. And within the very specific Caribbean context where all these other issues of class and so on come into play. And it's about trying to make connections. Um, Patricia Glinton McCullis, um, Remembering, Remembering, Slavery Redux, and Woman Unconquerable. These are her three poems in this collection. 
And I would say in these poems, past is very much present because they, they deal with issues like loss of ancestral home, the need to connect gender. Um, my name was scraped from the register of the grill's tongue and fed to sharks whose memory is short except for blood. Call me yours again, remember me. These are quotes from that um, first poem. Um, from the Slavery Redux poem, there's a, um, a line that speaks to aspects of neocolonialism. Year round, John Canoe will forge us new chains and manacles with small hope of emancipation. It's about how um, what's old is new again, in, in just in different ways, um, but also about resistance as we find in Woman Unconquerable. Here I am refusing reduction. I ain't going nowhere. This land and me is one. Again, that sense of ownership of place, of, of that being something that you can use to embolden you to fight the colonialism, the neocolonialism, the classism, all of it. Um, as I said, there, there are other um, languages of, of writers from other outside of Anglophone Caribbean in this collection. So we find um, Zuleika Rome Guerra from Cuba, something about me. It's a nonfiction piece that was spurred by, I believe, some sort of facetious questioning she received about colorism in Cuba. And so it's about slavery and colonialism as influences of contemporary issues. It's about blackness, it's about liberation, it's about colorism. And she says, 46 years of revolution cannot erase 400 years of slavery. That was her reply to them. And in continuing on the theme, she speaks about her great grandmother, who she remembers as a child, um, crying in the night, begging loudly not to be beaten. Because that's her memories from the, the, the slave barracks. Um, slavery would have ended in Cuba in 1886. And in her timeline, she had a great grandmother, not great, great, great grandmother, who in her Alzheimer's written mind was old and young enough to remember what that feeling was like. So it's not, the past is present in other ways as well. So it's um, childhood um, also comes into play here, her childhood, her grandmother's childhood. And we move on to Marina Salandi Brown, the lost daughter of Africa, um, who writes about her mother, now, Margaret Busby, who is actually preparing a German abridgment of New Daughters of Africa, which is forthcoming, um, said of, of this and other pieces like it, the binding thread of what mothers pass on consciously or otherwise is something that ties them together. So I think that is the theme in this piece, as well as race, migration, and colorism, the effects of colorism, of, of, one of colorism being one of the effects of colonialism, sorry. Her mother um, was, is she's Trinidadian. Her mother is, was born in Nigeria. They came back to Trinidad because that's where her parents were. Her mother's parents were working. Um, when the children were older, they came back to Trinidad. And then her parents went to her mother's parents went to Venezuela to work after the during the depression, the Great Depression. Um, so this is early 1900s, and because Marina is one of those writers in the 1950s sections, as with Carolyn and Marion and some of the others I've just mentioned. Um, so a few excerpts from that. In this British colony, the King's English had to be the standard and an African language was especially unacceptable. So she's talking about how her mother lost the ability to speak the language that she used to speak when she was living in Africa, because she had to you go, come back to the Caribbean, you're going to schools in colonial Caribbean and somehow these things are not acceptable because only the King's English is acceptable. Um, her younger, very after her parents went to Venezuela and she was living with family, that is Marina's mother, she experienced, painfully experienced colorism. Her younger, very pale skinned sisters soon recognized that they were more valued and mother learned of cruelty becoming their Cinderella. This beloved but lost daughter learned that she needed guile to divert the worst of her suffering. She resorted to telling the un telling untruths when necessary and hiding her real thoughts and feelings. And so we see the impact of history, even on children. Um, in Vereen Shepherd's um, historizing um, gender-based violence in the Caribbean, um, the impact of history is dug into even, even deeper because she connects it to um, just power power relationships going all the way back to the plantation. So the impact of history, color, class, gender, violence, and power. She writes how on the African enslavement, women's bodies became the site of power contestation and interrogates what fed this violence in the past and propelled it into our present. She connects the rape, sexual exploitation, verbal abuse, physical violence, threats, 
cruel and inhumane treatment and general female unfreedom experienced by black women in plantation times, i.e. slave society that was characterized by racism, ethnocentrism, classism, and discrimination against women in both field and house with gender violence today. Now, some might say this is a bit of a stretch, but it's really about power dynamics and systems and how somehow past or present women are battling to feel safe. And it still goes on today, still one of the biggest issues in the Caribbean. Um, Yvonne Dennis Rosario, her piece is actually, she's from Puerto Rico. Her piece is actually set in the New York public library system. Um, and it's sort of a, a sort of a, it's a it's, I, for me, one of the main takeaways from this story is the power of story, which I'll come back to. It also deals with race and cultural transference. She, and in the library, the, the character that we're following, she starts a story time where she's telling the children stories of, of their culture. These are the, the, the children who, um, the Latino kids, especially the Afro-Latino kids. Um, and she gets a lot of pushback and so on, but she says it works. You yourself, this is what she's saying to one of her colleagues, you yourself affirm that more and more kids come each time. And the Paul story is was one of my main takeaways from Cities of the Sun by Karen Lord of Barbados, who's a fiction writer. The sto her story begins right away with the minister, minister's secretary demanding a piece of propaganda from the historian. And the historian in what feels like a society where you don't say no to the system, she has to write it. Um, the secretary tells her, tell them how we got here, tell them where we are going. But what I liked about it was how it took that power story, because you have the power, the story has the power to fuel the propaganda, but the, the story can also that propaganda can also thread in stories of resistance or stories propelling resistance. So that if you can read the, the between the lines, you can get the other message that she's trying to pass on beyond what they're telling her to tell you. So um, after story jumps forward, did you know what your story would do? That it would change everything. You spoke of the enemy within. You warned us about our corruption. And she says, I only use the word blight once, maybe twice. Three times the person responds, it was enough. Which means that when you read the story, the, the story within the story, she uses the word blight several times and uses it in, in the way that we use blight, the blight on trees and so on. But if you can read between the lines, she's talking about the blight on trees to speak of the corruption in the system. And if you can hear it, then you will know not to be fooled. And so it's about politics to me in that sense. And politics plays into everything, including, I mean, one of the biggest issues of our day is, is the climate. And one of the problems is the lack of action on climate, um, the lack of re re resolve on climate from the powers that be. Um, and we saw the, we know that the Caribbean is sort of the super highway of one of the great climate catastrophes, which is every hurricane season, which feels like half the year right now. Um, there's a trauma I feel around hurricane season personally that I didn't feel growing up. And I was in Hurricane David as a child in Dominica. Um, it's more frequent, it's longer, it's bigger, it's slower. And Dominica experienced it with, um, with Maria, the same year as Irma. But um, so Celia Sorrendo writes about coping through storytelling, which is the connection to storytelling there. She writes about vulnerable people and trauma they experience. She writes about politics and the socioeconomics of survival. And she writes about the climate in a way that feels that you can relate to it on an emotional level. Um, the, she, the, she, she writes about her grandmother here, who in her basement storeroom had hunkered down and knelt her knees raw with prayer, the whole long lashing night, lashing tail of night. Um, and then, of course, after the hurricane came the crazed lines for food. Elizabeth Walcott Hackshaw is from Trinidad, and her story, Ashes, is also about place, but it's not about the it's not about nature and trauma in a sense. It is about trauma, but of a different kind, interpersonal kind. Um, and it is about place. It's about women, gender relations. Um, it has some vestiges of the past. It's mostly about modern Caribbean. And so we see the women going through, well, one woman is going through a breakup and they're talking about 
themselves in relation to the society that they're in. Migrating was something we were both thinking about and we shared dreams of setting up houses in London, Paris, Barcelona, New York, anywhere but the Caribbean. And what I, what I found interesting about this is that there is a sense sometimes living in the Caribbean of, of what they describe as um, it feeling like they reference Jamaica Kincaid it feels like a small place. This can be suffocating, the, um, the, the story says, um, which is true. I live in the Caribbean, I love the Caribbean, but sometimes it can be suffocating and it can feel suffocating because of so many variables that you don't have control over. And the story kind of delves into one of it being, you know, the judgments around you and um, the 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 ways that other people try to define and limit you and and what you're going through or don't really understand what you're going through so i like that it um it dealt with that on an interpersonal level as opposed to you know the sort of more macro issues um lisa allen agostini she was uh if you don't know she's a trinidad and tobago writer she's from the 1970s writers i just dated from the 60s she's from the 70s born in the 70s um she is she was um long shortlisted sorry for the women's prize for fiction this year for her book the, um, the bread the devil need but her story in this collection is called the cook and having read um lisa's other novel home home i would say that lisa writes very much about the modern caribbean and how unsafe it can be for black girls and she's not afraid to go there in terms of illuminating the violence of it and the interior life of, of black girls. I want to read um, it, um, some of this, it's a lot, but um, I was always a loner. Between the gangs outside, the crack selling on my corner and the whores drinking in the rum shop, my father always wanted to be up under me and my mother always busting my ass with licks. It was best to find a little corner to, and hide away, away, keep safe. In school, it was the same thing. I can't wait to get away from, the, from them, from there, from that. So we get a sense of that same suffocating um, dynamic that we saw in, in Elizabeth's story. And a lot of it has to do with how you're perceived and how, how you're defined, which goes back to um, Naomi's story about um, Trevor, the, the boy saying that, well, he's going to be what he was, what his father was before him. Um, in Seaview, I'm just the bony, ugly black girl with big eyes and thick lips. But through the lens of a professional's camera, I'm exotic, beautiful, sexy. I can't wait to get off this island for good. There it is again, the desire to leave because it is too small here. That's how she describes it. It's too small here. There's a way you feel it sometimes when you everybody know your business and everything. And you know, so I I um I, I found a lot relatable in this story. And of course, because of the legacies of colonialism, we have the anti-blackness, the self-hate, the colorism, internalized and external, because we will see that it is external in this story. Um, she did tall, the story is told forth from different perspectives, and this is the last voice we hear in the story. She did tall and thin and black, and she had did plat up in falls here, hanging down all by she bottom, and she did look like a magazine model or a girl in a nasty picture on the TV. Not the white girl nastiness so with them blonde white girl with fake breasts, but black people nastiness with big bottom woman and man with wood like chair food, except, except she wasn't a fat woman. She did thin and hard, but she bottomed it fat, the only fat thing on she except for she mouth, she mouth, she mouth. She had them thick, rude lips, and I hold she neck and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and stuff wood in she mouth, force open them rude lips till she choke. As I said, Lisa shows you the violence of existence, how unsafe it can be for Black girls in this society. Yolanda Arroyo Pizarro is a Puerto Rican writer, and her piece, Midwives Fragment, is also very violent, but it's in the past, it's historical fiction. Um, it's violence um, from slavery times forms of, violence is a form of resistance, including infanticide. Um, to the historian, she had her, her dedication is to the historians for leaving us out. Here we are again, refusing to be erased. Um, the character in the story who runs away multiple times and is caught and eventually executed. During one of her runaways, times running away, she says, I make an oath to the gods of the wind. If I am ever caught again, the children shall pay. 
And then the last thing I quote from her is they underestimate us. And from that I take, they underestimate what we're willing to do to not give them the power over our lives. They underestimate what we're willing to do to survive. They underestimate that we will survive in spite of their best efforts to erase us because erasure is not, one of the things, the struggle may be what it is, but we have not been erased. And that's one of the things I talk about in my story. Um, Margaret, I'm gonna quote Margaret and what she said about this story in the German um, abridgment that's coming out. She said, evening ritual is uplifting in the, in the course of making us think about how the past is memorialized. Now this story was um, originally um, inspired by a picture I saw, which is, is referenced in the story. It's um, a woman who works in the hotel industry. She's raising her niece who is curious about history and they're having, they're kind of having a sort of domestic moment. She's, she's kind of, the niece is kind of tending to her aunt in a way who's tired, her feet are weary. She's feeding her, she's rubbing, you know, um, and she's also talking with her about her, what she observed when she visited a plantation here. Oh, well, in the, in the world of the story. Um, and one of the things is that some get plantations named after them and some get erased. Some consider plantation is Betty's hope in the story. Emily continued, Betty got me thinking about women who don't have slave, who didn't have slave plantations named after them, you know? Women like us, Veron, that's her aunt said. And as the conversation continues and they see the, the sort of reflection of then and now in terms of um, the ways in which the modern space is, is the resort tourism is constructed like the plantation economy in some ways. Um, Veron told her the only truth she had. Black women hard for rub out. Black woman hard for rub out. Them need that some special eraser for that. And do you see them? Yeah, I see them. So that's her kind of reinforcing to her aunt that you're not dead until no one is alive who remembers that you, remembers you. Um, and so as long as they don't have to have their names on plantation, you see them, you know them, you, re you remember them. And the daughter in the story is, is actually writing about it. So they will be, um, they will be written down in history in some way, shape or form. So it's an encounter with the past. It's also the power of story to, to, um, to the power of story to, to, to document us, but also to, to help us to see ourselves. Um, coming up to the end, Attila Springer Castle in the Sand. She writes about a visit to Elmina. Um, so it's an encounter with the past. It's also about sisterhood and community. So she does a description of Elmina and also going down into the, the slave hold. The roar of the sea is distant as is the sun's light. He shows us where the governor would stand and select women captives to rape. My mother into gives me guinea pepper and white rum to stabilize my ori. I hold the seeds and liquid in my mouth, focusing on the heat to counter the feeling that my head is about to explode. I want to share this last part of what she said in this essay um, um, because I find that there is a narrative now around, you know, the past is the past and it is, but it's also the present and it's also so many unresolved issues. So she writes, to those who say it's time to forget, I say that the stench of 400 years of human waste is unforgettable. To those who say black people should get over it, I say we need more than ever now to understand enslavement is real and present and as much a threat now as it was 170 years ago. Some of us choose enslavement now to material things and people and the God of someone else's ancestors and the drivel of politicians and looking like someone else. It is history, but it still lives. Um, so remembering our experience is important. Um, the final author um, who is from the, what I call the Banya, Libya category of writers in this book is Alake Pilgrim of Trinidad. Attila is also from Trinidad, by the way. Um, remember Miss Franklin? This was, this was a, a sort of soft, but hard hitting story. You know, those stories that they seem so gentle in the, in the way they're, they're crafted, but they, they, they punch you in your stomach. And this was one of those. It's about remembering, as I said, Black people experience, Black people in the Caribbean, 
It's set in Barbados in 1928, so it's historical fiction. It's about loss and yearning. It's about desire and repression. It's about resistance and freedom. Ma had told her once, them caves full of ghosts, still hungry for their freedom. So we see that place hold, places hold memories of the past, places hold pain. See that there? Um, uh, one day when he's a man with thick black hair like his father's and solemn dark coffee eyes, she hopes that he will remember the soft used pages of books hidden in the folds of her skirt. That's why to share that line. It's such a whimsical, soft line, but again, about remembering. Um, she's remembering a lost friend, a lost, I think a lost love and possibly the real father of her child, but maybe I'm reading things into it. Um, but he died in the war, the first of the capital W wars. Um, others said the West Indian soldiers had to fight two wars at the same time, which also touches on the racism that they experienced, that Black people in general in, the, uh, in fighting in the two W wars, um, but also um, Caribbean people. Um, but it's also her own journey. So, um, she thinks of all the women she could have been. So gender, our experiences and how they're shaped by history, class, political and other dynamics are at play in all of these works in various ways. Um, the specifics shift through time, but at no point in the timeline are issues related to blackness and or black, and or black womanhood, not an issue. If I think about that too hard, it makes me sad because it means that we're still in the struggle, but we're different stage in the struggle because when you read the book, the issues in the past and the issues in the present, um, there's a shift in terms of the kinds of issues. I mean, obviously we're not in chains anymore, but we're in different kinds of chains and which are, you know, socio -psycho psychological, mental that we need to break with. Um, economic chains, these um, resident Caribbean women writers explore so much of our blackness, our black womanhood, from sexual awakening to violence, from black love to resistance, the natural world to the vices of the modern Caribbean, crime to politics, the ways it can suffocate, and at the same time, the benign everyday lived in Nessa written all its complexity. In their writing, we see that Caribbean and more broadly, the black experience is not all sunsets and it's not all sewage either. It is life after a long history from which we are still emerging. Most importantly, they demonstrate the enduring power of story in fighting erasure, in transferring culture, in defining ourselves for ourselves as Black people, as Black women in the Caribbean then and now. And while that's basically what I wanted to say to introduce the Caribbean resident Caribbean women writers in this collection, the Banya Libya Caribbean women writers in this collection, I did want to dedicate it to Lynn Sweeting, my presentation, I know this is unusual, but she died recently. She died in 2022. And for her commitment to amplifying the voices of Caribbean women writers, um, um, through her journal, Women Speak, the Journal of Art and Writing by Caribbean Women, which she published nine volumes of between 1991 and 2018. And I know she was working on another one when the pandemic hit, because I've been publishing it a few times and I know that I had submitted something to it. And um, then I heard that she had died um, as we started coming out of the pandemic. So I want to dedicate this to her because she's been doing the work of amplifying the voices of Caribbean women for a long time. And this collection does that in like a supernova sort of way. There are 200 women in this collection, 39 born in the Caribbean, 19 of which still live in the Caribbean or still lived in the Caribbean. and. Um, so this was a little introduction to them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joanne, for that comprehensive review of the book, really giving us more than just a feel, it really took us into the book. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. <clears throat>